cargo del profesor Friedrich Losser, ¿eh? la conferencia del profesor Friedrich Losser. Y me gustaría presentarle eh, eh, en dos sentidos. El primero es que, como yo sé, y ustedes también, que generalmente, no, y más a esta hora de la tarde, cansados, suelen interesar más las cosas concretas y personales que no las cosas abstractas y, y generales, digamos. ¿no? Entonces, haré, comenzaré haciendo un pequeño comentario más personal sobre mi relación, en fin, y lo que yo he sabido del profesor Lossel a lo largo del tiempo, y luego un poquito un comentario más formal, académico. ¿no? Eh, más personal eh, es, es lo siguiente. Yo conocí al profesor, o sea, tuve noticia del profesor Lossel hace muchos años, cuando yo hacía mi tesis doctoral, o sea, yo, digamos, trabajé en una tesis doctoral sobre la rehabilitación en Europa, la eficacia de la rehabilitación en Europa, en los principios de los años 90. Y entonces, como uno hace, buscar bibliografía, lo primero, ¿no? Pues me encontré con que la primera bibliografía que busqué me aparecía un profesor Lossel, ¿no? Porque yo estaba pensando en, en evaluar la rehabilitación, la eficacia de la rehabilitación en Europa, y el profesor Lossel ya lo había hecho en Alemania, ¿no? Tres años antes, en el 87, había publicado unos trabajos al respecto. Entonces, ahí, en fin, digamos, busqué su, esa información, también le escribí, etc. ¿no? Luego le conocí personalmente, en el año 91, estoy hablando de una etapa muy antigua, gente aquí que no, que no había nacido todavía, ¿no? Pero en la, él, yo era muy joven y él también, ¿eh? en esa época. Entonces, le conocí personalmente en Nuremberg, donde él era director del Departamento de Psicología en la Universidad de Nuremberg, y en ese momento era el presidente de la, eh, de la, eh, de la European Association of Psychology and Law, la Sociedad Europea de Psicología Jurídica, digamos. ¿no? Y entonces, eh, él justamente dirigía el primer congreso de esa sociedad, que se acababa de crear, en la Universidad de Nuremberg. Y recuerdo, recuerdo la escena del profesor Losser como un profesor alemán clásico, digamos, con un, tenía una campana... Y con la campana nos llamaba, como hacemos aquí, que, oye, que empezamos. Pues él llamaba con una campana, recuerdo esto, ¿no? With, with the bell, I remember you from Nuremberg, with the bell, just asking people. ¿Yo? <risa> bueno, luego, después, en diferentes congresos de la Sociedad Europea de Criminología, en Oxford, y en el siguiente, que fue justamente aquí en Barcelona, y en este centro. Este centro, nuevamente, concita los círculos de, de la historia de estas cosas, ¿no? En el año 94 hubo eh, uno de los congresos de la... Eh, Sociedad, Sociedad Europea de Psicología Legal, aquí, bueno, cuando, en este centro, no físicamente, cuando estaba en, en, en Roger de Flor, ¿no? Pero bueno, en este centro, y eh, en fin, tuve ocasión también de conocerle, de hacer un congreso sobre eso, con ellos, con la sociedad. Después tuve el honor y la ocasión, junto con mi buen amigo, el profesor Vicente Garrido, de participar en aquello que se llamó en su día el movimiento What Works, o los, digamos, la idea de, rehabil, rehabil, re, eh, eh, de, de poner de nuevo de relieve y, y rehabilitar, valga la redundancia, la rehabilitación de los delincuentes, que había sido denostada en años anteriores por diferentes evaluaciones, el famoso artículo de Martinson, etc. Entonces, hubo un movimiento en Europa que lideró el profesor Mac, eh, Maguire eh, en, en Inglaterra y en ese grupo de investigación, en ese grupo de revitalización de esto, de, de los tratamientos, pues estaban nada menos que el profesor Farrington, el profesor Robert Ross, autor del programa RNR, el profesor Mark Lipsey, autor de un montón de metaanálisis sobre la delincuencia, sobre la eficacia, estaba nada menos que Don Andrews, o sea, el famoso Andrews de Andrews y Bonta, estaba el profesor Cliff Holling, eh, de eh, Inglaterra, el profesor Friedrich Losser, ¿no? O sea que eh, fue otro momento y otros tiempos y de lo que derivaron dos libros. Luego he estado con él también en la, en la, en la, en la, en la Campbell Collaboration, que es una eh, institución internacional dedicada a justamente evaluar la eficacia de los programas de tratamiento y de prevención en el mundo. Y, además, y últimamente, lo, en fin, la, el contacto más reciente e importante, pues ha sido, él fue tutor de mi proyecto de investigación en una estancia que hice en Cambridge hace unos pocos años y que me permitió, con una beca eh, eh, Salvador Madariaga, del Ministerio de Educación, pues escribir el libro El origen de los delitos. Durante ese mes estuve allí con él y tuve la, eh, bueno, la suerte de trabajar con él y con el profesor Farrington, pero también verle en Cambridge, y aquí ya paso a la parte académica, verle en Cambridge como director del Instituto de Criminología de Cambridge, 
unos días y a la vez director del Instituto, o sea, del Departamento de Psicología de Nuremberg, en Alemania. O sea, es decir, él pasaba unos días, era director en Cambridge, en Inglaterra y otros días. Entonces, le veía a menudo pues, correr realmente de un sitio para otro y, en fin, atendiendo mil cosas. ¿no? Entonces, él actualmente, voy a la parte académica, es profesor emérito del Instituto de Criminología de Cambridge, de la Universidad de Cambridge y también de Nuremberg. Eh, en términos de publicaciones y de investigación, pues eh, ha sido, eh, o sea, ha dirigido investigación y ha realizado investigación en delincuencia juvenil, sobre prisiones, sobre tratamiento de delincuentes, sobre tratamiento de delincuentes sexuales particularmente, sobre eh, violencia en el fútbol, sobre eh, eh, bullying, sobre personalidad, eh, digamos, trastornos de personalidad en delincuentes, sobre factores de protección, sobre abuso sexual. Como resultado de todo ello, ha publicado eh, eh, en torno a 400 artículos de investigación eh, eh, y capítulos de libros y más de 30 libros, ¿no? Más de 30 libros. Ha dirigido también y dirige, dirige en la actualidad proyect, un, un estudio longitudinal en Alemania eh, un, sobre prevención de, del delito. Y luego, en términos, ha sido una persona, aparte de su dimensión académica, muy eh, también eh, eh, ha sido un gestor de, de, y, y director de, de, de aspectos académicos, que también es otra, otra parte muy relevante para el desarrollo de la ciencia. ¿no? Pues ha sido presidente de la Asociación Europea de Psicología y Ley, presidente de la Asociación de Criminología, eh, de la Sociedad de Criminología de los Países de Habla Alemana en Alemania, ha sido, eh, eh, ha sido, ha sido miembro de la Sociedad Británica de, 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 de Psicología, eh, del Mass Plan Institute, eh, en fin, de un montón de instituciones, digamos, que donde él ha eh, contribuido pues, al desarrollo de todo esto. ¿no? Y, por último, pues, como resultado de esta labor investigadora y académica que ha, que ha realizado, pues, ha tenido también el reconocimiento público, ¿no? académico, por ejemplo, pues eh, el premio a una vida dedicada a, pues, a los temas de la psicología criminal de la, Europea, de la Asociación Europea de Psicología y Ley, el premio Selling and Gluek de la American Society of Criminology, eh, que es un premio muy prestigioso, el premio de la eh, eh, o sea, eh, también el premio de la Academy of Experimental Criminology, que, de la cual hoy él eh, es presidente, y también, y, y, lo, y el más importante de todos, el premio Estocolmo de Criminología, que es como, digámoslo así, el Nobel de Criminología eh, en nuestro ámbito, que es eh, desde hace años, y él fue, eh, lo obtuvo el primero, digamos, el primer premio que se creó. En fin, por todas esas razones... Yo creo que es un lujo inmenso contar esta tarde pues, para esta charla final sobre la evaluación del tratamiento de los agresores sexuales con el profesor Friedrich Lossel y nada más. Thank you very much, uh, profesor. Um. Muchas gracias, Santiago. Unfortunately, I cannot speak in Spanish. It's a great pleasure to be here and I understood some what things you said. Uh, thank you very much for your nice words. Uh, I think the other words did not say that I owe you 1,000 euros, or, uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> but I don't know that. Uh, this was the, one of the greatest conferences I ever was, this uh, Barcelona conference in 1992, four, three? Uh, wonderful four, conference. Four, I think so. Four, wonderful. Uh, 400 participants, a wonderful atmosphere. Everybody remembers very well, so perhaps we should run again in the near future. I organized twice <laughs> in Nuremberg in 90-something, 90 90 and in, 90, uh, in 2015. Um, I was in uh, uh, Philadelphia last week for the American Society of Criminology Conference, and it was very cold outside. As you know, the hotels, the conference hotels, are even cooler. They have this air conditioning. Here it is a difference. It was very warm outside this afternoon. After I finished my talk at approximately one, I prepared it in Germany, but I finished it here. here. I walked down to the harbor, <coughs> the Rambler. It was a wonderful weather, and I was sitting in the sun and had some tapas. Unfortunately, only one glass of wine, because I have to give this <laughs> talk in the afternoon. This is always a problem when you are the last one. <laughs> you cannot enjoy the day. Uh, In Germany, we have the phrase, the last one is bitten by the dog. So when you are the last one, the dog comes and bites you. But it was nice and fun, and I uh, know 
uh, and um, Andrea and um, other people, and it's great, great, great friends here in this country. Uh, my talk will be something like a wrap up of what we currently know about the effectiveness of sex offender treatment. I will not only tell nice stories because the situation is complicated. This is why I, where are my reading glasses? I, I will sit because I like to use the mouse and not the pointer because I do not want to speak to the wall, so I prefer uh, the mouse. We have controversies, and I think we have some progress, but we need to go on further with a differentiated approach. At first, because I more and more realize talks are uh, a little driven by where, who you are, from where you get your money, and what interests you have. And in medicine now, I'm a psychologist by training, originally clinical psychologist, we have now to declare our conflict of interest. I think it is also important in sex offender treatment. I currently do not do any sex offender treatment. I did it when I was younger in some practice. Uh, I am a principal investigator of an evaluation project of the Ministry of Justice of Bavaria, but this is not our own program. It is done by us, so I have no interest. I have advisory roles. I am on the Correctional Services Accreditation Panel of England and Wales and on a program uh, prevention of sexual abuse. And also, I'm currently chair of a committee that supervises a project on sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church in Germany. This is one of the most sensitive things you can be involved in, you may imagine. But no interest in any program. I do not get any money from any program. Or from it. You all know it's a highly pro emotional topic in many countries. And the media reports on the most serious cases are real, always a fuel to uh, the discussion in the general uh, public. People overestimate crime rates. There are projects out, one in Germany, to estimate what was the development of sexual of, of offending, different kinds of offending over the last 10 years. And the people said violent offending went up three times. Sex offending, they felt, went up 10 times over 10 years. In reality, official crime rates in sexual offenders are nearly stable. So it, the official ones, so of course, there's a target field. We have in many countries a double crime policy. On the one hand, getting tougher, harsher punishment. I do not exactly know how it is here. But on the other hand, investing more in treatment. Because they see, even when we are harsh, we need to let them out of prison after some years. And then if we don't treat them, the risk is the same or even uh, worse than before. And we have controversies among the best scholars whether sex offender treatment works or does not work. I give you a few examples. Sato et al., I just had an, today exchange of an email with him. He said, similar to Karl Hansen, there's no clear evidence that sex offender treatment works. We need more good quality studies, randomized control trials. I will address this later, it's very difficult. But Marshall, you know him, I think he was also here in Barcelona. He was at our Nuremberg conference uh, two years ago. The critique is wrong, sex offender treatment works, particularly when you do it according to his uh, program. Yeah. In England, uh, uh, Dr. Ho, a medical doctor, and Ross, this is not the Ross you mentioned, yeah. he wrote an article, Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Sex Offenders, Too Good to Be True. Ruth Mann, one of the leaders of sex offender treatment in the world, she wrote a contrary uh, uh, paper, uh, Ho and Ross are wrong. Ho in 2015 wrote again that sex offender, SOTP means sex offender treatment programs, do not work. And he cited the work that Martin Schmucker and I have done in 2015, uh, 2005 as a proof for his statement. This was the first time that I wrote a letter to the editor of a journal. It was a British metal gear journal. Uh, Johann Köhler, he was a former research assistant of mine. He is now at Berkeley in America. And he sent me an email, have you read? I said, no, I don't regularly read British medical journal. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ho has this, uh, this and then. And it's the first time, so I had to get very old to write a letter to an editor. And we wrote. This is not the proof in our study. We had a more differentiated view on that. But you see, 
Many people think, and particularly in the political arena, it is like this. This is a Nuremberg funnel from the 17th century. And here is a delinquent. He has some deficits. Here are the magistrates. And the deficits are compensated by pouring some liquid that compensates for his problems directly into his head. And the saying was, sicher und schnell macht er die Köpfe hell, that's German language. It's safe and quick in making heads bright. This is what the fantasies about sex offender treatment are. We have a program, we change the mind, and then it's okay. Unfortunately, the Nuremberg funnel got lost, and we do not have these easy methods now. Crime policy is often not based on evidence. We must be really realistic. It is based on political attitudes, on media reports, and so on. An example, in uh, 1998, the German uh, penal code was revised as quickly as I never experienced that a new criminal law was introduced. And it focused on sex offender treatment because we had some very serious cases of child abuse and killing of children. Though within a few weeks, there was a change of the law. And because it was so quick, I looked into the evidence at this time. And, and, and the, the outcome was, uh, on the one hand, harsher punishment, and on the other hand, mandatory treatment for sex offenders with a prison uh, sentence over two years. I looked into the evidence in the German-speaking countries at this time and could not find any sound research that would have backed mandatory treatment of sexual offenders. Uh, there was significant effects of treatment in other areas, no less violent recidivism, less other recidivism, but not a reduction in sex offenders. And most studies were very weak. Uh, let me uh, present another example. I was in Cambridge in 2007 or 8, I don't remember, and a colleague from Germany phoned me and said, have you heard that? I said, what? There was a case in Bavaria, a man who had been sentenced for uh, raping a woman. He forced her into the in a car with a knife, and then he raped her. He was sentenced to eight years of prison sentence, and then he got uh, treatment. He was in a treatment-oriented prison. He got, we have uh, reviews by experts, whether there's progress or not, whether there's still a, I think it's the same in all civilized countries. And the treatment, people said, yes, he made progress. The assessment said, yes, he can be released. So he got an early release after six years. And he came out, and after a few weeks, he did the same. He raped, he forced her into his car, threatened her with a knife, raped her. And then he killed her. And she was the wife of a prison officer. So the absolute catastrophe. And at this time, the Bavarian, uh, new Bavarian prison law was in the parliament. And of course, many members of parliament said, you see, sex offender treatment does not work. We had a very courageous, courageous female Ministry of Justice. And they organized a workshop where practitioners and I was asked to present what do we know about sex offender treatment. And at the end, she stood stable and she introduced a research institute afterwards for the Bavarian Minister of Justice. And one or two years later, I met the head of the uh, Ministry of Justice uh, section on, 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 on prison and treatment, and he said, if we would not have had a little evidence, what we had at this time, the Bavarian prison law would have uh, looked differently. And this is why I think we can discuss thousands of hours. But the key issue is what does the evidence tell us? And not only what do we think about sex offender treatment. A recent <laughs> experience, this is now the last example at the beginning, uh, the so-called uh, uh, sex offender treatment scandal in England and Wales. Last summer, uh, I was in Cambridge and a journalist uh, approached me and asked me, uh, I have heard you were on a panel that looked through a study that has been carried out in England on sex offender treatment and evaluation study, a very large study. It was for two years discussed by a panel on which some statisticians and Carl Hansen from Canada and myself were also on it. 
They produced a number of drafts, but at the end we said it's not the best study, but it's relatively good. So, but it was not yet published. And this journalist heard it from somewhere that there is a study in the Ministry of Justice sitting there and is not published. And then he published, this is not the best journal, uh, the mail, but the mail on Sunday is better than the mail <laughs> during the week. And here you see the scandal of the sex crime cure hubs, how ministers buried report into 100 million prison program and so on that increased the risk of sex offenders, of pedophiles. This was the poor <laughs> Justice Secretary Liz Truss who was attacked for that. Of course, she did not know any details. Uh, but I do not read it out now. But you see what media make out of one study if they want to scandalize something. And I think you may have similar experience. In, this is similar in many countries. What did the study do? It was a large study. There were 2,500 roughly convicted sex offenders, and they took the standard sex offender treatment program in prison that Ruth Mann and her colleagues had developed. Uh, and there was a propensity score matching. If you don't, need the, you don't need the details, that means when you have no randomized trial, you look for many variables and put them in and make the groups comparable on many 80 variables or 60 or whatever. And they compared it with a matched group of more than 13,000 sex offenders who did not receive the treatment. 87 matching factors. Overall, the sex offender reoffending rates are low. This is a good message because in many countries, sex offender reoffending rates, official rates, went down over the last 10, 15 years. They were 18, 20% some time ago. They are now lower. So there seems to be some improvement, but it is not hard evidence. Uh, as you know, sex offenders are also doing other crimes. So it was larger for other crimes, more than 38. But when it now comes to the comparison, sex offenders reoffended in the period of follow-up 10% with a sex offense, in the control group only 8%. So the control group without treatment did somewhat better. With regard to child image, a very actual topic, the comparison was 4.4% to 2.9%. So this is really something we don't like if we're working in this field. And I was really uh, alerted. I did not tell this guy anything because I said we are not allowed to say anything. But he got the message from somewhere. And then it was what the Ministry of Justice wanted to hide for more than half a year or nine months was in the media within three days, because then they had to react. But my view that I always communicate is never trust one study. Evidence comes by replication. You need to have replication of results, then you have a more solid basis. One result. There are so many influences I will show you later that I personally do not trust, whether it is a very positive or a very negative study. We have a very positive one here in Spain. I looked into the literature, and this great friend near me uh, was together with Vicente Garrido. You see, this is a study from 2000, when was it? 2008. Sexual reoffending, re non-sexual, total. You see a dramatic difference. It was a cognitive behavioral approach. They were successful. It was also not a fully comparable group, but this looks very positive. So if we would only quote this one, all people would say, hooray. Unfortunately, this is one side of the uh, story. Uh, when we look to meta-analysis, meta-analysis, for those who don't know, means we integrate a number of studies. Vicente has done a number of meta great meta-analysis, really. You put 50 studies on one topic in one analysis and look at what is the mean finding, what are the differences between the findings. You see there's much heterogeneity. Here is a study I mentioned before, 2000, very small effect, in, it was a German study. Some have very large effect, 0.5 uh, as a D coefficient. And when you compare with studies on general or violent offender treatment, this is the longer the bar, the greater effects. Don't look into the st statistical details. And a comma is always a dot in the American, because in my German PowerPoint, I only have the comma. The Germans have a comma when they 
Americans have a dot. The Spanish have? Uh, we have both. You have both, yeah. okay, <laughs> that's great. So, <laughs> yes, this is flexible. <laughs> you see, at first glance, the effects are more homogeneous. So, you say something around 15 to 20. But here we have much more heterogeneity in sex offender treatment. Why? We have fewer control studies. We have very different eligibility, so selection criteria for the meta-analysis. We have often small samples. We have often low methodological quality. We have heterogeneous index offenses from serious rape to uh, indices and images uh, and so on. Different offender types, I will address this later. We have influences of comorbidities and we have heterogeneity between and within treatment modes. We have different outcome criteria. We have different follow-ups. In UK, often the follow-ups are very short, one year, two year. In Germany, they are very long, eight year, nine years. Uh, and often, when we are evaluating a program after eight years, we are evaluating an old program because they have changed the program in the meanwhile. So this is one of our serious problems in this field. However, there is some consistency. We did a meta-analysis in 2005. I only mentioned it briefly. We had 80 comparisons between treatment group and control group. There was a mean significant odds ratio. I do not go into statistical details, but better than one is positive. You can also poll it in the other direction, but we normally poll it in this direction. On average, six, six percentage points, reduction of recidivism in the treatment groups of these 80 studies. Cognitive behavioral treatment was significant. Hormonal medication, so metroxyprogesterone and so antiandrogenes, was significant but lower methodological quality. And the absolutely strongest effect was surgical castration. I do no longer present the figure because it was really so high. And when I give a talk to the general public, this is what they like to hear. <laughs> castration is the right thing. Uh, but the studies are the weakest because the control groups are not comparable. These, the control groups are people who have not applied for that or who have not accepted because of mental health problems and other, other risks. So skip that for ethical, legal, and methodological quality reasons. It's no longer a topic, but there are a number of studies out. Uh, another finding I would like to mention is 45% of the differences between different studies were due to methodological differences, not to content of treatment, not, but the methods you evaluated the program. Only very few uh, randomized control trials, and most studies had low quality. It's a level two of the Maryland scale. That means a treatment group on comparison group cannot be assumed as being equivalent. And of course, then there can be selection biases and so on. This is why we did another meta-analysis in 2015. It is in the Journal of Experimental Criminology, but you can, very similar study, get free access in the internet in the Campbell Collaboration. It is a Campbell Collaboration review. Look into the internet Campbell Collaboration and you can download it for free. Uh, and we only included now level three, four, or five. That means we can assume equivalence. I have good reasons for assume equivalence between treatment groups and control groups, and only official recidivism as outcome. So make it very homogeneous, published, unpublished. More than 3,000 documents had to be searched. You know how much work this is. People often think, oh, meta-analysis desk research, you can do it in two afternoons. No, it is more work than some real field uh, studies. Finally, only 27 studies were eligible, and some had compared different treatments, so we had 29 um, independent comparisons. More than 10,000 sex offenders involved, half and half approximately treatment and control, mainly cognitive behavioral treatment. This is now more or less a dominating kind of treatment. No study on hormonal treatment fulfilled the criteria. I know there are studies underway, but they have not yet been published or are not yet accessible. A few data on the data. You see more research is going on now in recent years. Until before the 80s, we had nearly nothing. Now we have more and more research. 
Still, very few randomized control trials. The majority had level three, but this is not so bad. Uh, Follow-up periods, you see, they are rather good. We have often 37 to 60 months, so that means five years at the end, and we had some st uh, eight, nine studies even with more than 84 months, so these are long follow-ups. Here are the results. Uh, this is a so-called forest plot. Don't uh, be skeptical. I explain. This is the effect in this first study, the Baldwin et al. here. And this is the uh, confidence interval. The longer this line, the unsure is it whether it is a significant effect. And when this line touches, like here, this one line of the odds ratio, then it is not a significant effect. So what do we see here? We see the majority of effects are on the positive side, so on this side, but some are on the other side. And most of the findings in these studies touch this one line, that means they are not significant. This has to do with low sample sizes and so on. It's not very <laughs> great message, as you see. A few are clearly positive. Here, for instance, here, here, touching not the one line. But when we calculate now a mean effect across all these studies, you see it's not touching the one line, and we have a mean odds ratio for sexual recidivism of 1.4, and for any other recidivism of 1.45. So this is a positive message on cognitive behavioral treatment, 1.38, so it's the same. What does this mean? Translated into reoffending rates, 10% roughly for the treated offenders in all studies, 13.7 for the non-treated, and a similar pattern. And this means, because it often sounds, oh, it's only three percentage points, but three percentage points are, when we take the base rate into account, a 26% reduction. This is not bad. Maryland scale, no significant influence. Randomization, this was really surprising. We have some studies with very strong effects. This is multisystemic therapy. I will address this later. Others had no effect, and one even went in a negative direction. A very good study. Why is multisystemic therapy for young sex offenders having so strong effects? Uh, some people don't believe it, and I'm also skeptical, I must say. Uh, most evaluations have been done by the groups themselves, not by independent researchers. This is not meaning that I think they are cheating, but you have so many decisions to categorize and so on, and at the end you may like, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, a more positive result. Uh, and there were also other methodological problems. Little had a fight with the Hengeler group over many years. I don't know going to do. Some reviews suggest better effects of sex offender treatment for young offenders. They are out. I mentioned this in, my first, in one of the first graphs. You have seen them. But there is a recent review, a very restrictive inclusion uh, of uh, criteria, and he did not find uh, a significant review for young offenders. So, I am still a little ambivalent whether the message it's better to treat young offenders or it's more effective uh, is true. It's better to treat young offenders because as early as possible, of course, we should do it. But whether the effects are really better, we need to wait and see. We took out these extremely positive studies from our meta-analysis to be critical, and we still found a positive effect. So this was not really making the whole thing wrong. Sample size, this is something that is found in other studies as well. It's not a significant trend, but smaller studies have better effects. You found it in your early on general reoffending. We find it in prevention programs. This is not good news for governments, because small studies are often uh, model studies or pilots or so on. And when you run out to the field and have a large-scale implementation, effects often go down. This is the same in general psychiatry. It's not a problem of our field only. We find it in many areas. 
Why? It can be a publication bias, selective publication, no details. It can also be the case, these smaller studies you can supervise better, you can implement the program better, so you have a better quality of implementation. We found also that a good descriptive validity, a category we invented in the late 90s, that is the transparency of the report, how looks the treatment, what was really done, and so on, correlated with the effect size. A larger effect in studies with a higher base rate of recidivism, and this is one of our problems because the base rate is now so low, only 8% or so sexual reoffending, then you cannot get big bang effects because the number who reoffend are very low. Uh, the other one we can skip. Group versus individual sessions. This was a finding that was even now clearer than in our 2005 meta-analysis. When there is a group treatment, I would not argue for only individual because this is too cost, uh, is cost too much, but a mix of group and individual treatment. And when I have sent this result to Ruth Mann at this time, uh, uh, it was like a cold shower for her because she has just written an article with colleagues that group treatment is appropriate for sex offenders, but they wrote, I think, yes, I say it here. They explicitly say, uh, we have no evidence base for that. It was only therapeutic reflections, but we showed that some kind of individualization is appropriate. And think about yourself. If you, not the females, they have very few sex offenders, but if you are a male, would you really discuss all your intimate things in a group uh, and also the group atmosphere plays a role? Though UK has now revised their programs. They have now some more group uh, uh, individual elements in the program and not only group treatment. Also, Sato wrote there must, should be caution about pure group treatment programs for sex offenders. Um, demonstration versus routine practice. This is not significant, but in tendency, though the demonstration projects, when the program developers do a study on that and look, uh, have better effects in tendency than when it is routine practice. It's the same in many areas of intervention. Author affiliation, when the author is involved in the treatment and so on, the author of the publication, tendency to better effects. This is good news. Mandatory versus voluntary treatment, no significant difference. What could be the reason? We know it from drug treatment. Uh, uh, at first, they do not really want to change. They want to get <laughs> earlier out of the prison. And then this is why they do. But we can change their motivation over time. And this is why mandatory treatment is not so bad. Some people 10 years ago said mandatory treatment is bad. You cannot change people if they, and Sigmund Freud, you know, the psychoanalyst said, if, and so on, you know it. Different age groups, this I said may be partly true to MSD. Uh, offenders risk level better effects at higher risk. This is not the extremely high risk group, but in the lowest risk group, no effect. But in lowest risk group, the reoffending rates officially are 2% of reoffending. So you cannot really get an effect with these very small numbers who recidivate. Setting, there is a tendency, it's not significant, but you see prison treatment of sex offenders as a tendency, lower effects, than hospital and outpatient treatment, ambulant treatment. This does not mean that we directly compare prison with, we compare prison treatment with a comparison group in, in prison, and we compare here ambulatory treatment in the community with a comparison group in, out, uh, in the community, but there is a tendency for that. Why could this be? We have a number, I do not go into details, I look on my uh, watch and I know you had a long afternoon. You played longer than FC Barcelona ever played. They get millions of <laughs> euros for playing 90 minutes uh, and you worked now a whole day. You know all these negative factors that may have a bad effect when you are in prison. There is also some literature that says there could be a positive effect in some aspects, but overall there is a lot of 
agreement that the overall effects of incarceration may be negative. When we looked at a number of meta-analyses, Johann Köhler and I, this is not yet published data. Johann has it on his desk. I did my part already. Normally it's otherwise. Uh, he has done his part. I am delayed. Uh, you see, these are meta-analyses where we have comparisons in the community on comparisons in uh, custody, and the pink columns are the community uh, effects, and the blue ones, the good message is, the blue ones are not zero, they are positive, but the uh, community effects are larger. And it is not only a custody effect, because we also looked into programs again uh, for substance-involved offenders, and you see here the picture is not the same. It's mixed, and often even the custodial treatment had better effects. So it can be that for drug-addicted offenders, the custodial environment has a protective function, uh, function. When they are in the community, they often recidivate after a few weeks and go back to their uh, uh, drug groups. Now a few recent studies, this was now overviews. And our question is now, can we see this only uh, also in single studies? A study from Canada, all the, I do not go into details, all are custodial treatment in prison. Follow up very long, treatment a control group. It was not an RCD, it was a quasi experiment. No significant general effect on sexual recidivism, but significant for violent recidivism, what I mentioned before. Significant sexual recidivism in high risk offenders and longer time until reoffending and more harmful reoffending. So it was not a significant overall effect, but more differentiated view says there are some positive outcomes. Smith in, 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 in Holland, uh, they have an RNR based treatment and social therapy, no details for time reasons. They had made parallelization by static 99 and other factors. Again, no significant main effect on sexual recidivism but marginally significant for high-risk offenders uh, and high-risk offenders recidivated faster in the control group. And this is not trivial because if we can extend the time of recidivism, as we know when offenders get older, they fade slowly out, sex offenders not as much as others, but then we have a chance that they will not again reoffend when we keep them for some time without offending. Grady et al., an American study, uh, also let me uh, skip the details. No significant difference in the survival uh, analysis for sexual and violent resistance, an effect on nonviolent reoffending within 120 months. The authors conclude the findings generated from this study raise more questions than answers. I do not fully agree with them because I hope I can give you some answers, but it must be more differentiated. A German study from my own area, Andres and Breuer, on social therapeutic treatment, again, a quasi experiment, and they did not find a significant general effect on sexual recidivism, but significant effect on any recidivism. There was even a tendency of a small effect on low-risk offenders, but an opposite tendency, negative tendencies for high-risk offenders. Not good news. But we are together, we are now, have, uh, I'm leader of a, a new project, and Hans Endres and uh, uh, Mike Capro is also involved, this Institute of the Bavarian Government. And we reanalyzed recently their data by propensity score matching, so a different approach, not the static 99, a very simple uh, parallel. And we found now uh, that there's slightly lower sexual recidivism than in the control group and also less serious recidivism. Uh, this is not the latest message. We need to work on These are brand new data. I got this this week from my colleague who has done these analysis. But it shows, and we need to show the government, one study and one method of analysis is not giving us the final answer. This must be learned. By, of course, it's a difficult message. We have so many methodological problems in this field. Uh, we have convergent and divergent findings. 
nearly all recent evaluations found very low base rates of sexual recidivism. We have difficulties, therefore, to get an effect because, we, you know, when you are psychologists, we have a floor effect. You cannot go further down. Uh, when the effects, the, the base rates are higher for violent offending, then we get positive effects. We also have the problem that most studies use a dichotomous outcome, re-offended, not re-offending. This is a very, very rough criterion. Uh, indicators such as delayed time of re-offending, frequency, harm, and so on, are more promising and should be included. And we should be aware that the program is not telling all the truths. These are studies on cognitive behavioral treatments for sex offenders that have been carried out relatively well. And what you see here, some have positive effects, relatively positive effects, some have no effect, and some had a slightly negative effect. So very similar programs. So it is not the program alone. And this is a model that I also think is very valid for other areas, general offender treatment, developmental prevention. We have a number of factors that have a role. The program factors, of course, the type of program, but also the quality of the delivery, intensity, basic format. I do not go into details. If you are interested, please uh, write me an email or load it down. It is on the net. The treatment context, custody communities, the institutional climate, staff competence, the kind of the therapeutic relationship. Most studies do not investigate that. We know from general psychotherapy that it's highly important whether there is a good relationship with the clients or not, but it is not addressed. Offender factors, Surprisingly few studies really differentiate. They only differentiate risk levels, but not what strengths do they have, what kinds of types, what personality only. No psychopaths, these are normally excluded because one is pessimistic. Uh, denial, uh, Hans Endres in, my, in our group has now uh, published a study, I think in German only, showing that denial has no effect on the outcome. So if somebody denies, he, or partially denies that he has carried out his sex offense, has no influence on recidivism rate. In former times, we said, if he does not confess, then it's over. But he wants to keep face. He wants to keep his own personal image. These things play a role. And the methods. The methods are particularly important. Quality of design, sample size, practice versus demonstration, independent evaluation, and so on. And you see, when we differentiate, the findings can be a little more promising. Like in other areas of offending, Hansen and, Hansen and his colleagues found that the R&R model, risk, need, responsitivity, if all three principles are fulfilled, effect sizes are better. This should be a little higher, but uh, this is empirical research. But when no principle is fulfilled, you even get a slightly negative effect. We are doing a program in the best intention, but the outcome is not as you want. A few words on assessment, uh, because I realized there was today also this area uh, addressed. I think there's not so much more uh, uh, lectures are necessary on that. We have a number of instruments, the static ones, static risk metrics, the SFAR20, RERAC, SAN, SONA, and so on. We have relatively good results. This guy has also done, together with Perez Ramirez, a study that has shown uh, 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 sexual uh, 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 SVR20 has good uh, validity in predicting reoffending. A typical area under curves are between 70 and 80. I think your study was at 80 or even slightly higher, so congratulations. This means in the, as a correlation, but only 0.20 to 0.30, or it's not a big bang effect. And we have many false positives, particularly in the middle range. We are good in the extremes, high and low risk. In my view, there's an upper limit of all these kinds of uh, uh, prediction, of long-term prediction, when we predict over three, four, five years, of around 0.40 as a correlation. Why is this plausible? because we are predicting a single act 
a concrete offense of a person. And we know from basic psychology that single acts are very difficult to predict. Only multiple acts can be better predicted. I think we need more short-term replications, uh, short-term predictions so we can address current stress factors and so on. And we need, of course, for treatment to address not only static risk factors, this does not help for change, we need dynamic and causal risk factors. Prediction does not require a causal explanation. It's only a statistical relation. Uh, I do not go into detail because I assume most of the people here are working in this field, so you know what are the basic assumptions about origins of uh, sexual offending, replicated criminogenic factors, sexual factors, cognitive factors, relations. They are in these instruments when it is a dynamic instruments. But it is not yet the absolute truth. These are promising factors, but a number of offenders do not have some of these factors, or only uh, not so many that you can say they will reoffend. Conclusions, a few more slides will come, sorry for that, uh, on sex offenders. We had less progress in sex offender treatment than in prediction and assessment. We have some progress in evaluation. For instance, what I have shown, I hope you agree or get a little convinced, community treatment. So if somebody does not need to go into prison, we should try to treat him. Of course, for legal reasons and ethical, we cannot let them out. We, uh, 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 more individualized format, smaller, well-supervised, well-implemented programs. We have still no increase in randomized control trials, but we must also be aware of randomized control trials. My colleague in Cambridge, Larry Sherman, he says we must always do randomized trials, but we cannot do this in this field often because when they are very high risk, we cannot say, okay, we let them be for four years without treatment when he is such a serious offender that is a risk for, for women and others. And also, there are other threats to validity. We have selective dropout. We have many other problems also of randomized control trials. Um, therefore, I propose a third phase of what works, and these are now the last few slides. We need a more systems-oriented approach and not thinking about this program does that, but the broader array of programs, the climate in the institution, the relations, and so on, uh, because they have accumulated risk factors and many difficulties. Uh, we need to evaluate packages of interventions. Uh, this is very similar to what in medicine was done 30, 40 years ago when they began doing uh, clinical pharmacology. They did no longer start, study only the effects of one drug or one invention, but a broader combination. And when you have a grandmother who is not so healthy, you may see she takes 10 pills a day, different ones. What is the effect of these combinations? And it's similar in our field. Uh, we need better, this is more difficult to evaluate, but we need theoretical concepts for that. We need differentiation and individualization. Many treatments in practice, this program is implemented like one size fits all. However, we have very heterogeneous offenders, very heterogeneous types. We need to pay more attention to specific responsivity. And I was very pleased to see one study here. Uh, I think you were also involved in that, yeah, with Tony Peach also, yeah. Martinez Catena, 2016. They exactly recommended this. They analyze, oh, sorry. They analyzed different types of offenders and their dynamic risk factors, and they found differences, and at the end they recommended we need now to relate this to, I don't know whether they related it already, I don't know, but they recommended at least we need to relate this to intervention. We need more translation of these assessments to intervention. We need more comparative evaluations of programs. Uh, of course, we need some structured programs. We need to conserve. This was a real advantage and progress that we have manuals, that we have structured programs, and not a therapeutic uh, approach leaning back, tell me your story to the client. No, this is, should not go back. But we, we must differentiate it more with regard to their needs and circumstances. 
relationships. I can keep this very quick. This now is more research. We know it from general psychotherapy. The relationship between the, of the client and the therapist is as important as the kind of therapy. This is well known, but it is not so yet well addressed in our field. There are now some programs, the SEED program in the United Kingdom and the STIX program in Canada. I will say a few words on that later on. Also, the Good Lives model is addressing particularly the relationship issues. Uh, we need more process evaluation, how it is implemented, the quality of delivery. For instance, we have sometimes a fixed format, a group starts and goes on. But we have also programs in the United Kingdom, a rolling format, the group starts, and when somebody drops out or somebody leaves the prison, a new person comes on the program. I am a little skeptical with regard to group atmosphere, but the practitioners say, yes, it works, but we need more evidence on that, whether it really works. What is the optimal degree of manualization? What is the adequate program length? We are currently need to save money in the UK, and the government asks us at the accreditation panel, can we shorten the programs? <laughs> yes, we can, but how much? When is it too short? Uh, but what is the best sequence in longer prison sentences? It is good to have a program at the beginning because they are motivated when they come in, but then they bear forget most what they learned when it comes to uh, uh, leaving the prison. So refreshments, booster sessions are important. And in particular, aftercare is important. Uh, that there is, and in many countries we now have for sex offenders who are released from prison, we have programs in place to treat them, not only classical probation supervision, but with treatment elements when they are in freedom. Staff treatment, I skipped that. This is a good example. From Canada, this is not for sex offender treatment, but for general offender violence. Of, but sex offenders are also included. What uh, uh, Jim Bonda and his colleagues did, they developed a program. A program they called it Sticks. How the probation officers should interact and talk to the client who is has been released, and they realized that often the probation officers hears and the uh, client, the uh, released offender says, yes, I have this problem, my wife is not doing well, my children, I need a new uh, furniture or something like that. And they said, we need to concentrate our talks with these clients to what we have done in the CPT program in prison. So there is consistency. And you see, reoffending rate in the control group without this program, those probation officers who have been trained with this program did better, lower reoffending rates. The institutional context, I mentioned it already, we need to look more, what are the counteracting factors, impact of programs in the context of a prison. I, I do not make you any more tired. And finally, I do not go through again, we need, there is in the field, there are clinical psychologists, psychiatrists out who are open for neurobiology. But then we have the social workers and the sociologists who are not so open for that and say medical approach is wrong. The truth lies in between, in my view, because we know from uh, depression treatment it is very effective for the serious depressions if we have a cognitive behavioral approach supported by some pharmacological treatment. And we have some promising approach with serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors. We have some promising, not for all uh, sex offenders, of course, anti-anthrogenes. And we need more cautious look because we have progress in this field. How brain functions, there may even neurofeedback as a method in the future that not for all, for specific groups of sex offenders. And now we need to go further by an evidence-driven development instead of the general controversies I have presented at the beginning. In my view, there is no gold standard of sex offender treatment. Methods of evaluation are highly relevant. We should also not polarize now some people say the good lives model is better than what works. This is not at all true. The good lives model can easily be integrated in what works. Some say desistance model. Yes, desistance is important. I worked on resilience and desistance, but this is factors in the natural environment. 
But you cannot simply say he gets now a good wife if he is a sex offender, so we must try uh, to help uh, to promote factors of desistance and not cease controversies. The key question is what works with whom, in what context, under what conditions, with regard to what outcomes, and also why I cannot answer this question now. Many people in medicine, psychiatry, they also say we have a differential indication but they can also not yet really answer this question. But we are on a way, hopefully, to progress on this path to answer it in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lussel, for your excellent presentation uh, at the end of this uh, seminar. We have just about five minutes. We are on time, more or less, fin finishing the seminar, but we have about five minutes or something like that. If so, some people here has any question. You have any question? Yeah. Spanish also in Catalan. <laughs> 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 or, or people just uh, looking at us by, by the, this, this uh, system, virtual system. <laughs> I think so. They are tired. They are it really tired. It was a long day. If the, I would be you, they are the resistors here. You know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As you like. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. The the, the micro. Micro. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I see. Um. What about uh, natural evolution uh, of, of human being? What about that? Uh, the natural process of uh, change of the person uh, and uh, the relation with treatment, more or less. <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, 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 it is a two-stage question, because when you talk about human evolution as a macro aspect, so uh, there is research out showing that over centuries, human beings became less violent. Statistical, historical data. Mm -hmm. It's still a lot of cruelty out if you look at Arabia, Africa, and so on. And of course, our sex offenders, some are really cruel. Uh, but the numbers overall, in former times, in 1400, for instance, when I would have traveled from Nuremberg to Bamberg, where I would have been in danger to be robbed, to be killed by some poor knights who, who were on the streets, similar to some areas in Africa. Overall, it went down. This is no doubt. But this does not help the poor women or the poor men who are experiencing violence in our uh, times. And so far, the question now relates, how can we change now persons? This is the second part of the question. And I am moderately optimistic, but moderately. Uh, we had some time in psychology when people argued very much against the concept of personality as a stable construct and said situation is more important. We now know both is highly important and some personality traits we cannot easily change. Of course, we can change intelligence by hitting somebody on his head so he has a brain damage, then he gets, or the famous uh, Phineas Cage, you know this case, when the brain was injured, he became more impulsive. Uh, I am a little engaged in the field of psychopathy research and also sex offending. And I feel from the literature and from my personal uh, knowledge and contacts that we cannot really change a real psychopath. But psychopathy is a dimension. You can have more or less. And we can help and train a psychopath, at least when he has some intelligence, and many have, uh, how to act out his dispositions in a way that do not include criminal behavior. The same with uh, paraphilic uh, sex offenders, sex offenders with a deviancy. There is now wide agreement of experts that you may not change basically his fantasies. So if somebody is attracted to young children or young boys, 
you can, of course, we can do some behavioral methods. We can give him electroshocks if it is acceptable from the design. Uh, that when he fantasies or sees pictures that so counter uh, uh, acted. But what we again can do, we can, and this is what these programs aim for, we can try to help to act self-controlled when risk situations come up. So avoid uh, playgrounds. Avoid in particular these situations when you are under stress, a number of cases where I have given expert evidence was they recidivated sexual offend in sexual offending when they were under stress, when they had problems at the workplace, when they had problems in their uh, uh, family if they had one and so on. So we can try to reduce the risk of recidivism or relapse prevention, but perhaps not change these persons totally. I, I, I'm we should not be too over optimistic, but the change of the overall uh, recidivism rates to the positive side are encouraging, not within one program study, but if you look over a long period of time, also that the society became more sensitive. These things are now more in the media. There are now uh, institutions that help women who are attacked and they try to speak to them, not all, of course. So there are also framing conditions that may contribute to this positive evolution, if we have one. Thank you. Alguna question més? Alguna pregunta més? No. No? Bueno, pues si no tenim més coses, eh, acabem aquí. Moltes gràcies per, per ser-hi aquí, a tots. Eh, so, som els racistes de la tarda, aquí. <laughs> I, i bona tarda, i a descansar. Gràcies. Gracias.